Matt Relkin says when he first saw the images painted and carved into the walls of Sego Canyon in southern Utah, it broke his brain. There were these strange anthropomorphic figures with horns or ornamental headdresses. There were these geometric shapes and concentric circles, some of them drawn in red ochre. And you could forgive him for thinking, at least at first, they looked like creatures from outer space. He had never seen anything like it. I was living in New York, working at a restaurant in Soho, and a coworker that also recently got hired was this guy, Alex Sendis, who is a Utah born and raised. I was already taking road trips. I was into landscape photography, and he asked me, how much time do you spend in Utah? And I was like, well, I haven't really spent much time in Utah. I've like maybe passed through. And he was like, I have a home in Moab. You should go through and you're welcome to stay there. And you should check out Utah and spend some time in Utah. So I stayed at his place in Utah and his dad, Ivan Sendis, was there. And his dad said, have you seen Sago Canyon? And I said, I don't know what that is. And he sent me on my way. And I went to Sago Canyon and pulled up and walked the little trail. And I don't think there was a barrier there at the time. You could get pretty close. But even just that approach where you kind of come around the corner and, you know, through these bushes and you see this thing up there. And I just saw these figures that I guess did break my brain because it was of a world I was not familiar with. The idea that this could come from another human being, I couldn't wrap my head around that. And that it's painted, and that it's painted on a cliff, and that it's outside, and there's lizards walking across it, and there's sun, and, you know, bugs and plants, and you're just, you're not in a gallery. You know, to me, it was obviously art. To me, a whole other world. That's the first one that blew my mind. Eventually, I developed the need and the want to understand where this comes from. Because then, you know, you learn there's more of these places and there's more of these panels that look like this. Later on, when I learned that there's different styles and different cultures and different periods, you know, and all this, then I started pursuing the idea of you know, maybe getting into the people's heads or just understanding where this comes from. And the more I saw stuff like this, the less I was thinking about otherworldly things, the more I was understanding the intricacies of ancient people and their imaginations. And the more I saw it, the more I wanted to be able to think that way and understand that. Not because I wanted to know the meaning of things, but just because I wanted to appreciate it more and appreciate the human beings that created that which then did lead to other things that are a little more complicated. You know, things about visitation and etiquette and what do you do, what don't you do, how can we make these places last, how can I appreciate them but not further degrade them. There's this whole world that I'm unaware of and I want to see more of this stuff. This is Radio West. I'm Doug Fabrizio. These days, you can find lots of social media accounts that feature photos of Native American dwellings and rock art. Matt Relkin has built his Instagram account to some 40,000 followers. He goes by the handle No Lonely Roads. We'll hear from him a little bit later in the program. You'll find lots of artfully composed shots of petroglyphs and pictographs and short video clips of him exploring dwellings and granaries in the deserts of the Southwest. But Relkin is manifestly aware that he's a white guy sharing the culture of indigenous people. He peppers his posts with disclaimers and reminders. He doesn't speculate about the meaning of the imagery. He doesn't even reveal the locations of these places. But he believes these sites are meant to be seen. Otakwan Achakos Isquiu, Evening Star Woman, agrees with him. 
She's a native model and anthropologist, belongs to the Métis Nation. She follows Matt Relkin's Instagram account. She has one of her own, where she also shares photos of rock art images. And over the years, she's seen the good ones and her share of the bad ones. To tell the difference, she told us she tries to apply what she described as her sense of discernment. It's not that I'm going around judging people. It's that often the thing that I'm cautious about and using my discernment is what kind of person is this sharing? Are they sharing out of good intentions and heart or are they trying to make a quick buck and are they like culturally like resource mining? Basically, Mm -hmm. they're they're mining our spiritual beliefs, our visions, our dreams, our hopes, like our very core belief systems. And then also if they're, you know, being respectful, I've seen influencers who paired with beer companies and they're sitting out there drinking and um, damaging and touching. And actually there was one that knocked over a wall not very long ago. (laughs) And it was all documented online and it was heartbreaking, you know, because oftentimes I will go there and pick up garbage, beer cans, cigarette Mm. butts, that kind of stuff. And you think who is going up there to litter, (laughs) right? It's wild. It's wild. So There's a little bit of trepidation, but again, you have people like Matt and others that I know who are really aware of their surroundings and trying to share these places in a good way and advocating for stewardship and, you know, bridging those gaps between our cultures, because we can share those places. We can, you know, look at them both and we have different perspectives and lenses. But I feel like if we educate and we help teach people how to behave there, that maybe that'll change the tide. And, um, you know, there are some people out there who have really good, genuine intentions yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, what's interesting is that it seems like there are, you know, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people who seem really interested in these posts. And so I wanted to get your sense of what it is you think they're drawn to. But before we get there, I wanted to ask mm-hmm. your own reason for being drawn to these places, because you've talked about this, how you would search these places out and that you have – yeah. Just a feeling that these sites or places were near. You've even talked about that. So what is it you, as a Native woman, what are you drawn to? Well, for one, it's the spirituality, right? It's our cultural connections to the everything. And the places, these places all have different meanings, right? They could be a map. They could be a warning. Yeah. Um, they could be a document in time of what what happened there at that place. Sometimes it denotes burial sites. But most often, these are places that our ancestors went to for tens of thousands of years, since time immemorial, to fast and vision quest. So, you know, a lot of times people talk about um, like churches and temples. For us, that is where we go. We go to these places in nature that are so special to us. And so that's the connection that we have. And our culture is everything because we almost lost it. There was massive amounts of genocide here on Turtle Island. And being able to practice our culture and be open and aware, that's that's everything. And I was raised traditionally on my traditional lands in Saskatchewan. My grandfather was a leader, a knowledge keeper, an elder for our people. And so, and I grew up with him and um, my great grandmother. So that knowledge was all passed down to me. And some nations are still practicing this to this day. It's not... Um, like rock teachings aren't uh, that thing that was only in the ancient history that people believe. It's still current today. Mm-hmm. It's just we're not always openly talking about these things. So these are cultural practices that are still very much involved. And they're intertwined with other parts of us as well. Like I have a lot of tattoos, but many of them are hand poked in, in ceremony. It's kind of like a receipt of our vision. So these places are receipt of visions. So I go to these places to pray and give offerings and thanks and to connect into everything. That's my church. Can I underscore something you just said? You said art, uh, art teachings. You don't refer to petroglyphs and pictographs as rock art. You prefer rock art teachings. Will you talk about that? What's, yeah. explain, the, mm-hmm. explain the way you see it and the, maybe the difference. So with, um, you know, like the westernized education system, it's looked at as art. Yeah. It, and oftentimes in university, it's not even classified in the archaeological or anthropological systems because I also have a degree in anthropology. And when I inquired on it, they're like, no, that's an art degree. And I'm like, but... <laughs> mm. 
<laughs> I'm like, these are histories and stories. They they belong in this other category. So that's how it became rock art, which is fine. And I go between the two, but I try to say teachings because they are teachings. They're teachings that were left there that transcend time and space because we still have access to them and they were left a long time ago. So they do carry meaning and there are some of them you definitely can decipher. So, okay. So what's the appeal for others who aren't native to to this land, who don't have a spiritual connection to those images? Because it seems like there's a lot of stuff going on for people. There's there's the the history part, I guess. There's a kind Mm -hmm. of mystery to it. There's a beauty to it. What do you think is the appeal for others. That's hard because I'm not really them. Yeah. But what I've noticed right from being on sites, uh, pages and things like that on social media or sitting in these conferences, because I attend a lot of conferences as well for um, rock art teachings is that you're right. It's multi-layered and leveled. And at the end of the day, we're all human beings and mm-hmm. rock art isn't just here. It's everywhere. It's all over the world. Every culture has their own history written in the rocks. And I think that people often go back because, yeah, they want to see it, right? Sometimes it's a romanticized version of who natives were. And, um, you know, people have built their whole careers off, basically. I would say misdirection Mm. (laughs) because that was the farthest thing from the truth. But then there are people that go there. And they're generally, they want to connect into it because it's like an imprint. It's an imprint of energy and good thoughts. It's like a place that people went and prayed to for thousands of years. There's a lot of beauty in that. And I think sometimes people, they do feel it. I know I feel it Mm -hmm. and other people do too. And they want to connect to that thing. And I think people are so, I feel like most people are so tired of the everyday grind and being told to hustle that they want to reconnect in to that part of them that they feel is missing. And most people do that by going outside. And these places, again, they're outside, they're in nature. Huh. So, because I think the the question I'm sort of getting at is, is it okay yeah. for a white dude, you know, to feel this deeper <laughs> sense of connection to these images? And I what you're saying so. is it is, right? Yeah. yeah, I think it is. I think it's a beautiful thing. And wouldn't the world be a better place if we were kinder to each other, that we tried to understand each other, and that we took the time to really reconnect into those things that matter at the end of the day? And and what is that? Like the earth. We all come from the earth. We're all human beings at the end of the day. So when does it maybe cross a line for you? Because it seems like this all becomes kind of clumsy and offensive when non-Indigenous people try and uh, here's one of the the ways you've put it to us take ownership of these stories or to try to tell indigenous people what they mean or take a kind of ownership um, of Mm -hmm. them explain explain that part like when they when it when they go off when it gets wrong yeah so um there's a few different things one of them is profiting off these images that's a hard one because i've been approached to do a book quite a quite a, a number of times and i've gone back to my, one of my mentors and teachers and i'm like hey like it, would i be able to do this and they're like you would have to go to every single nation and find people and ask their permission mm-hmm. to make money off those. And he's like, what kind of reciprocity is going to be there? Like, what are you going to give back to those communities? And that really hit me hard. And I thought about it when I see some of these people and they take the photos and then they sell them. And I'm like, what do you give back to those communities? Have you reached out to anyone? Have you talked to them? Have you learned the real histories and stories and the truths behind these teachings? Because again, sometimes they're not always, um, you know, there was one that I went to and it's a marker for smallpox that, um, you know, had basically really dev- devastated this village. And that's a really sad thing that have happened. That's a place of mourning. And to have people not understanding the context of those things sometimes and telling the stories in a different light and not reaching out to the people to get those histories and stories and then to profit off them, I think, is in really poor taste. But 
the one thing I've noticed on social media, um, myself and many other indigenous people do not go onto these petroglyph pages. There's, there's only one that I could ever promote. <laughs> and I think it's called pictographs of the Southwest, but the other ones are filled with these fantasies and often very racist dialogues. And it's sad because they want to look at these images and fantasize about what they are without understanding that we're still, these are living sites and we're living people and we're still here today. It's hard. It's hard when, when you're met with that much resistance, when all you want to do is, again, bridge that gap with education. You know, when you're talking about the kind of proper way to approach these sites, there's the stuff that seems quite obvious, right? There's the like, yeah. take out your trash. Um, don't yes. be, don't be drinking in there. <laughs> don't vandalize stuff. Don't, break down yes. a wall, all of those things, right? But then yes. there's the mm-hmm. the other part that I think is interesting in terms of the right way to approach this, at least from what I gather is your perspective or at least the indigenous perspective, because occasionally we check in with this Zuni elder and ancestral farmer um, oh, named, nice. Jim, named Jim Enote. And he's talked I to us about, him. do you know Jim? Oh my gosh, I know him. Yes, he's a friend of mine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, he's amazing. I love Jim. Yeah, yeah we <laughs> do too. And one of the things he told us is when he approaches an image on a rock, whether whether it might be a piece yeah. of art or a map or something else, he says he introduces himself, that he presents yes. himself. Mm-hmm. And this seems like something you do. Will you talk about this? Um. Yes, we can talk about this. There's no, there's some things if I can't, I'll just I won't For sure. speak on it yep. right? because yep. they're closed practices. But one of the first things we do is we introduce ourselves in our indigenous language when approaching and often drop either tobacco, corn, pollen. Um, that's what I was taught from some elders, some mm-hmm. Puebloan elders. And we also wear protections, you know, like I have my medicine pouch and then I'll carry a piece of turquoise and obsidian. Like there's just certain things that we do in protocols that we teach each other, especially if you're going onto other people's territories and visiting. That's why it's also important, I feel, to introduce yourself to the local nations Mm -hmm. (laughs) that are there because they'll tell you things that are pertinent to each site. But so I'll start off. It'll be Annie. uh, So I'm introducing who I am and my name. So they know when I'm coming, because again, we believe these sites are very active. They're living alive. Every part of it is living and interacting with us. And that's those beings homes. So we're always aware of where we're going, like whose home are we going into? Um, And I think that's really important as well that maybe sometimes people don't always understand is that, you know, coyote lives there, let's say, you know, birds live there. There's all kinds of things, but there's things that we can't see that live there too. And how would we like it if someone just barged into our house? (laughs) Start stomping around and being loud and rude and just left. Right. So, again, it's like a reciprocity thing. And you go there and you introduce yourself and you're kind. And it doesn't even have to like, you know, anybody can do it. Anybody can do it. Just say your name. You know, I brought um, non-native people with me. And it's like, say your name. Just say hello. You know, hi, I'm here. I'm respectful. And I'm just here to take a look. You know, there are some um, rock images that Matt Relkin has profiled that that aren't really ancient. You know, they were created not so long ago by Native people. Will you say something Uh about this? Because this is something you've mentioned, that they're still telling those stories, that this is not a thing of the the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we're still doing ceremonies, and our ceremonies are tied into these images. Like, sometimes we use those very images in our ceremonies. (laughs) So, you know, they're interchangeable. And again, like, I have traditional tattoos, which are also interchangeable with the rock art teachings and the ceremonies. Everything is, is, is... you know, I hate using that term because in anthropology, everything is a ritual or a ceremony, but it really is a ceremony because everything do- was done in a prayerful way with thought. And every part of even the pigment itself was prayed over. There was gifts given to receive those pigments or when you harvested, collected those pigments and those different parts that go into the onamen or the, the sacred paint, you know, or even the rock that was used to chip or scratch away those images well, I want to ask you this finally. Um, I was really taken by something you had said, is that it's important, you said, to go back to these places because you said they 
they were left for us to pick up the pieces, these places. So, that's correct. Say something about mm-hmm. that finally, will you? Well, oh, gosh, that's so multi-level too, you know, with, um, again, it being outlawed for our ceremonies, our religious rites. Uh, that's huge for us to be able to go back to them. Also, if there are sacred sites and you haven't been visiting them as a native person or utilizing that land space legally, it can be taken away from us. And it's part of who we are. You know, we had ceremonies for every part of our life, every milestone. And some people, uh, you know, they were really displaced. We had residential schools. We had boarding schools, you know, that the Indian Act, Indian policies, which all worked for, you know, kill the Indian, save the man. And that was to break those connections. But those teachings and what's there, they're waiting for us. They're waiting for us to come back and pick up those teachings. It's like a family with open arms. And I think that's absolutely beautiful. And it's beautiful that we still have these parts of our culture scattered all across the continent. So that's why I feel like it's really important for us to go back to those places. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Otakwan Achakos Isquiu, Evening Star Woman. She's a native model and anthropologist, belongs to the Macy's Nation. You can find a link to her Instagram account on our website, radiowest.org. We'll take a break. Come back in a moment. You're listening to Radio West. This is Radio West. I'm Doug Fabrizio. Today in the program, we've been talking about how people have been sharing Native American rock garden dwellings on social media. The thing that got us started was Matt Relkin's Instagram account, which goes by the handle No Lonely Roads. He shares photographs and videos with some 40,000 followers. These days, he spends most of his time running social clubs and cocktail bars in Portland, Oregon. But every year, he takes a long break and heads to the southwest. Matt grew up in Florida, spent a lot of time in New York City, but he told us there was just something about the desert. I was so interested in landscape photography and painting and that landscape, just the variety, and that when people think of a desert, they could just think of sand and rock, but there's so many more intricacies to it and the flora and fauna and everything, and it was... I dedicated time to, you know, learning a little more, like learning the names of trees and and bushes and grasses and stuff like that and learning about the animals that live out there. It felt easier to me. Just I don't know why. Just I was more interested in that growing up on the East Coast where everything was just, you know, green and hills and mountains. It it gets kind of old. That variety really got me. And and I felt comfortable out there. Um, I felt I just felt like I belonged yeah, and I still feel like I belong. Yeah. You, yeah. You connected in some way. However 100%. you explain it, you, yep. you did. I could wake up every day alone out there and be content to a point, you know. You know, it's interesting. That one of the things you t- talked to us about was that you would take these – you would come out here. You would take these photographs and then – at least as I understand it, you would you'd go back to New York and then you would – translated into art like you'd paint yeah i would it, use right? that as reference for paintings and stuff and my paintings wouldn't really have anything to do with what i'm interested in now they would just you know i would paint landscapes and maybe have some sort of fantasy element or yeah. some geometric shapes floating in the sky above them but i was very interested in the painterly aspect of of those landscapes like the, the people i looked at were were more classical landscape painters and i was interested in that and i wanted to be a really really good landscape painter, but I still wanted to be able to add something that was different than just painting what you see. You know, I I was being creative in my own right because I liked fantasy and sci-fi and stuff like that. So I was creating my own world. And I guess you could say I maybe made some kind of connection with the images I'm looking at with people creating their old worlds. How could you not? I didn't at first, but I think it just naturally, eventually I realized that you know, it just eventually just shifted over. And it's like now I'm so focused on that. Well, and focused on the the way – it seems like imagination mm-hmm. is is kind of an, a, a theme in, in the way you think about this. The idea of, as you said, 
they didn't have the same kind of stuff to draw on. Their muse was the the life they lived um, and nature, right? Correct. So at least we assume. We assume, that. We assume. Yes. And, and that's one thing we'll we'll come back to this yes. in a minute. Like we don't have any idea. We don't exactly. know if that was art. We because you know there are some that that we on our program have talked to some indigenous people who say, well, it might be art, but it, these are also maps. That's and why I don't call also, it rock art. Yeah, I call it rock imagery. Yeah, um, because you can't deny it. it's imagery. And personally, I look at it as art, but just because. I think it's art doesn't make it art because, again, I didn't create that. Who am I to say what it is? But to me, I appreciate the aesthetics of it first, yeah. the visual beauty of it. And then the the meaning and the, the subtext is not as important to me. I can get plenty of joy looking at something and having no idea what it means and just saying to myself, this is a beautiful thing I'm looking at. I, I really love this. This touches me. You're really careful with your language, aren't you? Um, and you're careful with – the way you – we'll talk about some of the etiquette that, and sort of the ethics that you think about a lot. But you're always mindful of the fact that you're not an indigenous person. Yeah. Um, I certainly try to be. I screw up though. I still you know, I still go too far with assumptions sometimes. And, yeah. But I'm – yeah, it's, it's very important for me to not perpetuate a lot of past habits of people that visit these sites. Um, I just don't want to be part of a problem. I don't want to spread misinformation. I want to show respect. I want to, you know, continue and hopefully educate people on, you know, proper ways to behave. And when I say educate people, I'm talking about other non-native people. Yeah. I'm not here to trying to teach anyone about their own history and their ancestors and things like that. That's not my place. Um, it's a tricky subject because I'm out there and I probably know a lot of sites that some indigenous folks might not know. Um, and I'm not trying to hide that from them, but it's also I have to be careful with just the general public. If I'm going to post stuff, I don't know who's seeing that, you know. Yeah. And and these places deserve to be seen in in certain ways. Um, like I think there's a lot of people. I know there's a lot of people to get joy out of it because they message me all the time. And it's like I would never be able to go see this place mm-hmm. in person. Thank you for sharing this with me. And it's nice. I feel like I'm definitely exposing a lot of people that would otherwise not know about this stuff. Um, and there's a growing appreciation for it, which I, hopefully I'm part of. Yeah. And hopefully that leads to more conservation or just in general more respect in the way that people look at these sites. One of your more recent posts um, was this area. Y- you described it because it didn't. it doesn't have a name as far as we can tell, at least that's in the public. Um, you describe it as Ute procession panel, um, and in the in the post that you made on Instagram, you were hiking around, and you come around this corner, and there you find this panel. Yeah, it's like twenty foot panel. Yeah, what's what's so interesting about this one though is it was created around. 1944, like that was the date. That's the date on, on it, there. On but Who knows, is, right? Exactly. But it's definitely post-contact. There's yep. horses. There's clothing that, that could be considered modern in the sense that it's not thousands of years old. Yeah. Um, but that's what I loved about that post because it, it had not occurred to me that they're not all, you know, quote unquote, ancient. And the, one of the things you say in the post is you found that – um panel as relevant and important as any panel from a thousand years ago. To me, yes. Again, speaking from my own perspective, yeah, I, yeah. I definitely see value in that. And it's also a, a stunning panel. I mean, the Describe idea it. of it's uh, so I call it Ute procession panel just because first it's Ute territory. Yeah. I assume it was done by someone or m- maybe multiple people that are part of the Ute tribe. Um, and again, I'm guessing here, but sure. still. And it's a row of horses and riders plus some kind of disconnected figures, figures that are standing. I think there's about seven or eight figures total. A few of them are just heads, but there's definitely riders. There's a horse with a blanket that is decorated and has – you could maybe call it a cross, but it's 
a symmetrical kind of sure. cross. So it might not necessarily be a cross cross. There's people with jewelry and hats and, you know, a few people with, like, top feathers. The horses have tack. They have, you know, the, the reins and gear. There's also this giant bowl, kind of, that looks like maybe it was done by a different person. It's not necessarily the same visual style as most of the other images on there, but it kind of looms over one of these horses and looks like it's touching the horse on the back. And it's just wild. It uh, it has so much to see and in so many frames of reference to maybe what time period this came from. I know it's not new because, again, when you see enough of this stuff, you can tell by the exposed rock, you know, that new stuff is essentially white. It is, like, bright. But also, when you see it, you know, if you see it enough times, it's it's, again, it's not thousands of years old it could be from the 40s because there is 1944 on there um but again someone could have put that on there after yeah. um it's definitely from the 1900s early 1900s um and it's just it's got so much to see and also so much that it doesn't leave a ton of room for interpretation there could be a singular story there like maybe this was an actual thing yeah. an actual group of people that were moving through and it's just it, it really gets the mind going and it's like kind of connects things a little closer to where we are now, um, a lot closer to where we are now. And it, it feels extremely human. And it's just it blew me away. That panel is so exciting to me. Well, I was going to use the word exciting. Absolutely. Exactly. Because I get I get I get a high from that stuff. <laughs> well, because it's. <laughs> You don't have to cast yourself back so far. To, because no. here is an exp- here's something from really not that long ago. And Maybe it's... my grandparents were alive right. when this happened. Like, yeah. And gosh, who knows? Maybe that was done by like a very talented 15-year-old and that person is still alive even. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really wild to think about. It also puts it into perspective that these things are – they're sacred. You know, they're still visited by living descendants. They should be treated with respect and protected, not saying protected, like put a fence around it and make it a park, but protected. Mm-hmm. You know, don't destroy it. Don't don't mess with it. Don't blast it to a bunch of people and sell coordinates and say you should go see this. I don't care who goes to see it. Just go see it. Um, that's not the right way to do it. You know, but that but I, I want to ask you about that, actually, because that is what some people do. Right. Just mm-hmm. Say a little bit more about that. Some people are selling these coordinates for people to go and find these places? Yeah, there's there's things I've seen online. I was actually getting, when I was on Facebook, I left Facebook, but I was getting ads for someone who it's it was considered a type of guide. And it was, you know, you pay them and you get all these different locations to dwellings and rock imagery sites and stuff like that. And it's a white guy doing it. Um, yeah. And it's just someone profiting but also, forget the part where they're making money. Like, they're just selling that to anybody to go to these sacred places. It's – I don't like to say, like, it makes me angry. It makes me angry, though. And it's – I think it's a pretty twisted thing to do. Um, it's definitely exploitative, and it follows a certain pattern of, you know, treatment that I don't want to be part of. I want to do the opposite, you know, but I, I I want people to understand that they can find these sites, you know, but there's ways to do it and there's ways to be respectful. Yeah. What's the um, – what are some of those ways? When you encounter a site, a dwelling um, – we'll, we'll talk about more about dwellings I- I- in a moment. But mm-hmm. is there a kind of proto- protocol or process that you go through to be – careful and mindful and what do you – I mean one of the things you, I, I hear you say on a lot of posts is I, I have my hand up here to compare it to the handprint this, you know, that's, that was there you know, 800 years ago but I don't have my hand on the wall. Yeah, don't do it. this. Don't touch it. So yeah. like what do you what, – what's the sort of the protocol that you go through? I say be a ghost and just – you know, you're going to leave footprints unless you're actually floating. Um, <laughs> but – it's quiet, slow, very aware of where you're stepping, just aware that you're in a sacred space and you don't really want to dominate that. Mm-hmm. You, you know, you should be in and out of there like you were never there. 
um, and that includes don't touch the imagery. There are some gray areas as far as pot shirts, things like that. You know, sometimes you'll see a piece of pottery on the ground, and I've picked up pottery and looked at it, and I put it back where I find it. I'm not going to dig. I'm not going to, you know, mm. I'm not, I don't want to disturb anything. Yeah. I want to leave there, and no one knows I was there except for there's going to be footprints. I could even try to brush those away, but then I'm possibly disturbing the ground and stirring things up. I like to be quiet. You know, sometimes I'll make a sound to hear the way your voice carries and the way sound travels in these areas because I'm sure that was a part of it. And you can imagine some of these panels, there's probably a lot of people around and they mm-hmm. might have been talking and there might have been a lot of action. It might not have felt like this quiet, solemn place in the moment. But I'm a visitor and, mm-hmm. you know, I'm privileged to be even able to go see this stuff. So I just want to be in there and out of there undisturbed and know that hopefully the next time I go back it'll be the same way be a ghost yeah Matt Relkin his Instagram account is called No Lonely Roads we have a link to it on our website radiowest.org we'll take another break come back in a moment you're listening to Radio West This is Radio West. I'm Doug Fabrizio. We're not sure just how many social media sites there are out there that showcase ancient native rock art and dwellings, but there are enough to call it a trend, if not a craze. The artist and photographer Matt Relkin is up to 40,000 followers for his Instagram account called No Lonely Roads. Today in the program, Relkin is joining us to talk about what he's learned about how to be careful and respectful of the spiritual and cultural value of these beautiful and mysterious places. Will you talk more about um, Barrier Canyon or Horseshoe Canyon, as I think it's also called? One of the panels is described as the Holy Ghost panel, and there's this great gallery. Yeah, and that, you, one's, that one's pretty intense. Well, so, so will you talk a little bit? One of the things you've, you've talked about is some of that art is like um, it could be a cloud. It could be an angel. Um, well, an angel, according to us, what we think right. angels are, you know. And <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, now for we're... sure. Okay, so so okay, so you don't want to interpret the imagery that you see and translate it into, you know, white guy imagery, white guy translation, or whatever, or just modern beliefs in general. For sure. So so, but when you see it, one of the things you've said was it it looks like whoever made this was reaching out. So what do you what's what to tell us about this, the imagery that you're seeing here. I mean, I can only tell you as far as what, you know, the imagery, what it looks like visual, visually to me because it's the Holy Ghost panel, I think, is what you – yeah, that one. The one thing that I remember most about that, I visited a couple of times. Um, I know exactly the panel you're talking about is the main figure. We can assume they are figures. They're – they have heads and, and facial features, and they're you know shaped like a, a body, be it a limbless body, but yeah. still, is that main figure almost looks like it has some perspective to it, which is cool, which you don't see very often. Like it looks like it's slightly turned, which I think is quite unique. It definitely looks like it's leading a group, or you know, there's these darker figures around it. It's it's a lot more detailed, and I can appreciate that the design elements of it all day long. I can say like for me it it definitely brings up this otherworldly feeling of, Mm. you know, this was a deep thinker that made this thing for sure and probably someone that did believe in possibly some kind of afterlife or just other realms. You know, again, I I, I can't really go deeper than that because because I'm not that person and I can just say what what it means to me. It, It definitely makes me think that there were deep beliefs and probably very complicated cosmologies of the culture that was making Barrier Canyon stuff. I assume life wasn't super easy. Mm -hmm. I bet death was a big part of things. And so, you know, in order to deal with that, and you probably wanted to have some sort of idea of what might happen next, because I'm sure things could get scary, you know, And, and I completely understand how someone would want to create that kind of stuff. Because as an artist myself, I've wanted to create, you know, mythologies and worlds that don't exist. 
you know it's i i get it from again i can only speak from like the artist's perspective mm-hmm. i get that it's pretty deep heavy stuff though that i can't go too far into again yeah. because i'm not that person right. and it's got to be so much more complicated than what i assume it could be you know or maybe it's not even again yeah you could go the entire other way how conflicted do you feel about sharing images of this not even just giving it away or saying where it is because you don't one of the questions you have asked yourself you've told us is why am i sharing this so how conflicted do you feel about that because you know you look you could live your life and probably get the same kind of experience just going out there finding these things taking note of them ma- making photographs or paintings or whatever and but not saying a word to a point but one of the things that I've learned in doing this is it's kind of brought back the whole idea of what social media originally was was huh. connecting like-minded people hmm. and I've made some of my best friends currently I didn't know until I started doing this and now there's people I go out and meet and we click and we go out and we hunt huh. to sites I have you know both native and non-native friends on Instagram. I have people commenting to me and, you know, I've definitely had plenty of times where I've done something and someone was like, you know, this is wrong or, or say I overassumed or I overinterpreted and things like that. And yeah. it's great. Like, like I want to be checked because I you know, I want to be doing it right. And I listen to the feedback. Um, I have tons of discussions. I also monitor my site, my posts, whereas if someone leaves in a comment like say they've been there and they they say is it a this site or i monitor all that stuff i delete it i it it takes a lot of time i make sure that you know people aren't kind of endangering any of these places but again there's people that both native and non-native that that comment to me all the time that appreciate it and there are people that are like i didn't know that I didn't know that you weren't supposed to collect pot shirts. And, you know, to mm. me, it's like, how could you not know that? But it's it's okay. There's You don't get taught any of this stuff, you know. You can learn it because, again, I'm not an expert. There's plenty of people out there doing this that are a lot more knowledgeable than I am. And I look to them. I read. I try to absorb as much as I can, but I screw up constantly, and mm. I try to correct it. And if I felt that I was harming these places, I would stop. You ask this really um, kind of provocative question in one of your posts of whether or not – well, the post was a a shot of what seems to be um, a pretty recent kind of drawing on a a rock wall. Mm -hmm. And I might be incorrect in thinking that was only a year old because a friend of mine posted – sent me a message that they think they took a photo of that 10 years ago. Either way – it's newish, new it, right? for sure, because you can just tell by the coloring right, of it. Right, right. Um, yeah. So the question you ask, though, whether it was last year or ten years ago, it's still fairly new. And you're asking, is that vandalism? Mm-hmm. Is it vandalism if a white person did that? That seems clear to me. It does. Right, me too. Is it vandalism if an indigenous person? does it at this stage? And one of the things you mentioned is you feel conflicted on the matter. And you said that that post generated a, just a ton of discussion. Yeah. And I left it vague enough because I genuinely wanted to just hear people's opinions. And again, uh, I would say a majority of my followers are non-native. I can't change that. But both native and non-native people commented on that. I wasn't trying to start a town hall about should this be allowed or not. I just want to know what people think about that stuff because, again, I'm certainly influencing people with some of these posts and I want to spread the right message. And my confliction was people see that and interpret – and, again, I'm talking about non-natives – that this was done recently. It's okay if I do that too. First off, none of us are in a place to say what a native person can do on their own ancestral land, let alone, you know, anywhere. Um, And I believe that if it's something that, you know, they've been doing culturally for throughout history, like, of course, you know, again, even if I thought that wasn't right, I don't have a place to say that. But this is a discussion that I wanted to have with the people that follow my post because I want to know what people think. I want to know what my audience thinks. 
I also want to be able to kind of help spread possibly more open-minded views and more understanding. Again, I'm not, I haven't been asked to be a spokesman for indigenous people, you know, like, and I don't certainly don't want to do that, but I can speak for white people. And I think that we could definitely behave better and definitely change the way we look at certain things. I'm sure plenty of people would disagree and plenty of my followers would, which they did say, you know, of course, you should continue this. This isn't vandalism. This is, you know, because I assumed from the post, I even said, I think this is probably indigenous made. Just by looking at the design of it and everything, I I didn't think it was made by like a white guy. And in my belief is like 100%, they should be able to do that. My only concern is it's in a national park where you have a lot of tourists that are going to see that and be like, oh, so like, it's still okay to do this kind of stuff. And that's the conflicted part is I hate the idea that people see something and then they take it as their own and and they don't really understand well why can't i do that what's the difference why can't i carve my initial and the date it's like and and i think you can't do that because it's not part of your culture it's not your land ancestrally and it's appropriation in a sense you know we didn't grow up pecking out petroglyphs um our ancestors weren't doing that you know maybe we have a rancher uncle that carved his name in a cliff a hundred years ago doesn't make him indigenous doesn't make your family indigenous in 10 generations if you still live in the United States. It's not how it works. There's a site on one of the posts you made uh, called the EC site. This was in New Mexico, which you figure was probably around three or to 600 years ago, this particular one. And it's a painted anthropomorph. Which is a figure. Like a figure. An- yeah, so anthropomorph figure, zoomorph, right. any kind of animal. Yeah. Four, like, but it's four. holding... Uh, a feathered drum or a or a shield, and the thing that's what that color my, is it? Because well, a that's few, it's a color. There's a few in that canyon. Is it all white or is it like multicolored? Well, you include both of those actually. Yeah, those in, are in amazing. The piece. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you about was the color because what that's one of the things you say is like the fact that the color's still intact. Mm-hmm. Um, I think is remarkable. But in, in the in the post, you said, just imagine what it looked like when it was first oh, painted. Like, it I must have been really vibrant, right? I, I would assume so, yeah. Because the, the, the multicolor one's pretty faded. You can still make it out. But, uh, I mean, yeah, it has, like, facial details. Like, the person looks like they're wearing possibly, like, face paint below their nose. And you can see an eye and that drum or shield or whatever it may be. It could be a sun. Who knows? Um mm. Yeah, the idea of what that must have first looked like, because just coming up on that and the feeling you get when you see this multicolor image, again, on a cliff exposed to the elements, it's this overwhelming just awe. And I always think back about, especially with pictographs, of course, just what these must have looked like, Mm -hmm. especially also when you see the vandalized sites. And I think we can name something like the courthouse wash panel, um, which is protected. It's it's almost impossible to get to, but heavily vandalized. And that's a multicolor barrier canyon site. And uh, it must have been like just unreal, the amount of color that's because the, the color that's still in there is mm. pretty mind blowing. Same thing with like with the, the great gallery, you know, and these again, these are places that are pretty protected and, and great gallery usually has someone stationed there, you know, um, so I feel OK mentioning some sites also sh- people should be able to go yeah. and see some places especially the ones in the national parks and like dinosaur capital reef things like that those are great opportunities for people to go see something figure out if it's something that, that they want to see more of but also just you know get an appreciation of that stuff and know that it's visitation is probably not going to damage those areas mm. too much because again they're pretty controlled and protected with barriers and things like that you you wrote that it's a miracle it lasted yeah. that that painting and is that part of it for you is well it's lasted it's amazing but it's not gonna last forever nope. and in some ways you're documenting making a record do you do you think about it that way yeah yeah and and it's just you know I it's we're all gonna be gone um and in this life <laughs> I want to be able to see the stuff that exists while I'm alive. 
you know, I want to have I want to have those experiences and, and I want to appreciate them. And I get feelings all the time when I go do repeat visits of familiar sites to me, places that I've seen again and again. Every time I go back, there's a, always a part of me that's got a little bit of dread that's, you know, wondering, like, is it going to still be there? Is it going to be mm-hmm. vandalized? Is it going to is the cliff going to have collapsed or something like that? I think that a lot. And it's always a relief to get back there. And it's like, oh, yeah, it's still here. I mean, it's lasted this long, you know, and hopefully in my lifetime, there won't be a change. That's part of the beauty of it, too, though. It's fleeting. See it while it's here. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Matt Relkin. His Instagram account is No Lonely Roads. We have a link to it on our website, RadioWest.org. Radio West is a production of KUER. You can subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. We're on YouTube at KUER 90.1. Stevie Shaughnessy is our intern. Radio West is produced by Benjamin Bombard and Tim Slover. Carrie Watson is our executive producer. I'm Doug Fabrizio. <laughs>